Amazon, by the way, is heading into fresh foods as well. So uh, your trips, I use TripAdvisor all the time. It's an awesome, this is how I figure out where I'm gonna go, where I'm gonna stay, based upon the crowdsourced knowledge of everybody else contributing their opinions, no photos. Okay, none of the kind of uh, superstructure that existed on travel before, it's all bottom up. Netflix, I can see anything on my laptop, I can see it on my iPad, I can see it on my iPhone, I can start the movie from the point I left from any one of those devices, as well as, of course, on my PC. Facebook, <laughs> okay, it's a phenomenon, billions of people on this, exchanging information and photos. It is the biggest photo repository ever, and it doesn't cost anything. Fidelity, you trade all your investments here. Essentially, it alerts you to everything that you want to know, all your online banking. So if I told you 20 years ago, oh, and whatever happened to Encyclopedia Britannica? <laughs> Okay, it's all in Wikipedia, another crowdsourced environment. So if I said 20 years ago, this is what I forecast, you would have thought I was nuts. <laughs> so think about that time frame of 20 years and think about that it's accelerated through that process so the actual change gets bigger as time progresses. The picture phone. The picture phone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, you needed the internet, <laughs> is what you needed. I, I could tell you a story about PictureTel because I gave speeches to the PictureTel. I'll tell you the story because what the heck. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if I should tell this story, but uh, okay, they had a PictureTel had, a PictureTel was the premier, if you remember, video conferencing system prior to the internet, okay, where they were using ISDN, et cetera, for and it was a public company, fast-growing company, Massachusetts-based company. And for reasons unknown, they asked me to come and give a talk. But the talk, I happened to be in California, their stockholders meeting was being held here. And they wanted me to talk at the stockholders meeting about the, essentially what was coming again. And I had to go very early in the morning to California. They still wanted me. I said, I can't be there in person. They said, well, this is great. We're picture tell. We can essentially arrange for you to have the presentation in California. That would even be better. I mean, this is only going to be a 10, 15 minute talk. And so I said, okay. So at 6 a.m. in the morning, I appear for a 9 a.m. meeting, the, the stockholders meeting in, in Boston, um, at this uh, public radio, their public TV uh, studio. And there's one gal there, because it's six in the morning, and she's the one that's going to organize all this. So I get there and they set up the studio for me, so I'm going to present. And as it turns out, the, everything's going. I'm getting to see what's going on in the stockholders meeting, and they cut over to me, introducing me, and something goes wrong. And, and nobody knows what it is. So I asked the gal that was over at who was helping out here, if she could help. And in the process, and this is why I said I don't know if I should tell this story, um, she was wearing a rather low-cut shirt. <laughs> and in order to um, fix the problem, she had to go like this, and the camera was going right down her blouse <laughs> in front of 500 people in Boston, and all of a sudden I hear this laughter coming from Boston, and I don't know what's going on until I figured it out. But, so that's the story, that's my picture tell story. But it shows the dangers of privacy and issues like that that exist in, the, in these types of technologies. But let's, going back to this, if I told you 20 years ago this would be, you would have thought I was nuts. So what is it that I'm gonna tell you today that you think is nuts? Well, I'm gonna give you some things, but in fact, I'm not extending out that far from what we're already doing. I'm gonna show you stuff that is essentially happening now that is, I, I think will make this point. But there is a much larger point that I'm gonna come back to. So what's the next 20 years going to look like? It's the end of dumb. <laughs> We've had a lot of dumb stuff, right? We've had dumb terminals, they were even called dumb. 
But almost everything that exists in the physical world is dumb. And I'll give you an example of how dumb that is because I'm experiencing it. I've got the luxury of having one house on the Cape uh, at Scraggy Neck and then I have a cottage on Amrita Island where it's about two, two miles away uh, in Bourne. Um, that is essentially the overflow because <laughs> I've got five grandkids now, God knows. But uh, it, it, that's the overflow house for the main house two miles away. Well. The problem is everybody wants to stay in the main house because the cottage isn't quite as nice as the main, so we're gonna make the cottage better. So in the process of trying, to, this is literally last week, um, I've got the contractor out to look at what we're gonna do and I've decided they're gonna put some air conditioning in it. Well, the cottage only has 100 amp service. So he says, gee, you know, the problem is if you put it, even if you put window air conditioners in, 100 amps, if those Psych, if those individual window air conditioners cycle on at the same time, you're gonna blow a, you're gonna blow a breaker, or worse. And I'm going, well, isn't there a way to, to have them not cycle on at the same time so I don't have to upgrade to a 200 amp service? No, you don't control any of that. They decide when they're gonna cycle on and when they're gonna cycle off. That's dumb, okay? <laughs> Why can't one air conditioner tell the other air conditioner, could you just hold on for about a minute or two while I cycle on, and then you can cycle on? But they can't, but they will. That's what the difference is between a smart device and a dumb device. And you're gonna see this all over the place. Everything's going to get smart. That's what the Internet of Things is all about. And in that case, I might not have to upgrade my service from 100 amp to 200 amp because the devices themselves will be smart enough not to draw that current when they shouldn't. <clears throat> so if you net this all out, what have we had around 24 in order to get to 128 for me to continue the journey back up to Waltham, which is where I went yesterday? I didn't look at it. <laughs> it told me. It had digested the traffic information, knowing my intent was to go to Waltham, and it presented to me on the car screen, I think this is what you should do, do you want to? Yes. That's the Internet of Things and something else which is becoming the semantic web, the ability of the web to essentially use itself to give us information. But it's not just that it's giving us information, is we're giving it information. How does Google know that there's traffic? How does it know? Anybody know? Bluetooth. Well, Bluetooth won't do it by itself. Bluetooth doesn't know anything about traffic. Right. Sorry? They spent a billion dollars on <laughs> They actually did this, I think, before they bought Waze. Actually, Google Maps keeps telling it. <laughs> if you're running Google Maps, it's going back up again. So it knows how fast you're going, right? <laughs> so therefore, it posts it back up again, and that gets reused again. So who's the sensor? You. <laughs> All right? You didn't even know you're a sensor. But increasingly, that's what's going on. It's not like, oh, that I'm the center of the universe. No, you're part of this one computer that exists. Everything is talking to everything. Sometimes you know about it, sometimes you don't. As Scott McNeely said about privacy, you know, forget about it, what, what was the term? Uh, get over it, yes, thank you. Uh, but the point is, think of that. That's happening today. I mean, we assume a lot of stuff that Maybe we shouldn't be assuming in the way that things work, but it's because of this one computer that is the image, and we have these devices. This is huge. This is the windows, the window on the one computer. It's also, in many cases, a sensor for the one computer, and it's also, in many ways, the controller of the one computer. But from the controller, you can control any other external piece that's essentially connected at the edges to the one computer. So we're going to get into that. The web has the capability of referencing itself. 
That gets a little scary as time progresses because it's assuming a degree of intelligence without us being involved. <laughs> if potentially, if you go to the extremes of this, you get into the web being the Borg <laughs> and taking over. But we'll see how that works. At least in the short term, it's a pretty good thing. One of the things that's enabling this is IPv6. We ran out of internet addresses. If you're going to have everything with an addressable ID, you needed, on the internet, you needed a bigger address. IPv6 provides a bigger address. So that enables, in the, in the scope of just about any hallucinogenic-inspired number of devices, enough addresses to handle all that. Because we're getting down, as I'll tell you, say, that everything becomes addressable. When everything becomes addressable, and you have very cheap, lightweight, miniaturized communications, low power communications, all of Bluetooth, those things can start communicating either unidirectionally or bidirectionally. Everything communicates either unidirectionally or bidirectionally with the cloud. We'll come back to why that is a big change from what we thought was going to be the way things essentially would evolve. Big data analysis, huge databases of information, the whole big data um, uh, analysis hype that's going around, it's useful, because that's what's going to be essentially digesting that information within the cloud in order to alert us to things that we want to know about. And the other piece is we are <laughs> one of those things. When we're talking about the Internet of Things, we're one of the things. Right now, we carry the thing that enables us to be part of that in our pocket. Pretty soon it'll be embedded in some way. You might have a heart monitor that's part of that, essentially, that's watching out for your heart and alerting people. Gee, you know, it doesn't look like it's really working that well. I think I'm going to call an ambulance for you, and all of a sudden you're walking around and an ambulance shows up. <laughs> so these types of things are not science fiction. Again, I call you back to the 20 years of progress in what we've seen. My God, this is happening faster and faster and faster, and we don't recognize it when we see it. This is a Tesla, <laughs> all right? Uh, Elon Musk is just a hero to me. I mean, this guy does the space projects, he does the Tesla, he is just the, the cat's meow right now. Um, but this is, I mean, look at this screen. There's nothing there. When you go see the car, I mean, it's black here, okay? But everything is controlled by this screen. And all the telematics, essentially, are built into here. So this car's capability is the early capabilities of, essentially, chips on wheels, as it's sometimes called. All right, the, the chip is the most important thing. The wheels are just dressing around the chip. So these become very, very much connected devices. Again, more and more we're going to be seeing this. So the concept here is that the internet has now evolved into one machine that is, instead of me going to a specific address, I might be going to a specific address, and it's going to n number of addresses which is going to end number of addresses and coming back with information and coming back to me or not going someplace else. So that's a big change. <laughs> and then the thing that really enables it are these mobile devices that we always have the ability to connect to the one machine. Okay, the one machine is always at our service, if you will. And on top of it, that one machine, I can control other devices. We'll come back to that. And the other thing that's interesting, it's, it's, no, it's really never gone down. <laughs> Pieces of it go down, but the internet has never gone down. If you go back to Bob Metcalf, I don't know if you remember him, the inventor of, the, of Ethernet, a good friend of mine until he moved to Texas. Um, but Bob invented Ethernet and predicted when he was running Information Week, uh, the paper, that uh, there was going to be a brownout on the internet and maybe a blackout. This was probably in the 99 time frame. Um, and if it didn't happen within the year that he said it would happen, he would eat his hat. You can go to the internet and watch him eat his hat. <laughs> it didn't go down, and that was early. The internet has not gone down. 
we depend on the internet not to go down. You get mad at Comcast and Verizon, right, when you don't have internet service, right? You've become dependent on it. You're going to be increasingly dependent on it, which just creates a whole host of issues that we'll come back to in a few minutes. But if you go back with, to Nick Negroponte, remember he read the books of Atoms and Bits, that the difference between that, you know, the, the new world was all bits and the old world was atoms. No, it's atoms and bits. It's the combination of the two now that create the power that we're talking about here. Negroponte punted it. I'm not a big fan of Nick's. So. <laughs> Did that come through? Yeah. I hate when these are video. Did I tell you the story about me? <laughs> being deposed as an expert witness in a lawsuit against uh, um, Google, among others, uh, about, um, uh, it was a patent suit. And I was representing the, the client that was saying that Google had violated their patent, which in my belief, I thought they did. So as an expert witness, I, I appeared in early January, I think it was, or late January, um, to be deposed in New York City. And I don't know if you've been deposed before, but it can be a grueling process. It's all day long, uh, et cetera. First thing the guy opens up with is the Cape Cod Technology Council's videotape of me saying Google was evil. <laughs> that came as quite a surprise. <laughs> I think we might have to edit this. Uh, <laughs> and you came back. And, and I came back, right. And, uh, well, it made my point. <laughs> it made my point. So the other thing that's happening is the web is like a black hole that's just sucking everything in. It's like everything wants to get connected now. So it, eventually it's going to be that if it's not connected, you're never going to buy it. <laughs> Why would you buy it? Because I can't control it. It's the old world. Everything in the new world is connected. I lost a house in the Cape because of the fact that I had a triple pipe burst in February that ran for six weeks. Despite the fact it had, you know, all the technology at that time, probably now 10 years ago, for low, you know, the, the, uh, 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 a low temperature alarm, calling a central station, all that sort of stuff. Well, what went wrong? Well, what went wrong is the fan belt broke on a forced hot air system, and the forced hot air system therefore couldn't, force, couldn't put any hot air out, the furnace was working great. Why didn't the low temperature alarm go off? Because it was situated, the room that the low temperature alarm was in was situated, as it turns out, geographically directly below the, flo the floor of the room that had the low temperature alarm. I'm sorry, the furnace was directly below where the... So the furnace is getting really, really hot because it's running 24-7 because it keeps on getting requests from the thermostat to get hot, so it heats the floor of where the low temperature alarm is. Wouldn't it have been great <laughs> if, it, if uh, I had maybe more than one sensor that maybe didn't call? Oh, where was the guy that was supposed to check the house once a week because it ran for six weeks? Well, as he said, I never really went in. <laughs> so these sensor-type systems could save you millions <laughs> if you only had them. And they're getting really cheap. And if they're connected to the internet, I can go and actually look at the house and see that the water's running down the stairs. I mean, things like that. But the point being is that this is a big change that has a lot of fundamental economics behind it. And it's the cheapness, as it's been in computers all along, that makes this really possible. And so let's. Let's just talk for a second. Let's say this chair over here, I wanted to make, for reasons unknown. I want to know who's sitting in it. <laughs> All right? Um, it's got a history. Everything now can have a history. How would I make the chair smart? I'd make it addressable. I'd have to give it an IP address. I can get an IP address in a heartbeat. Okay, V6 IP address, and now this chair has an IP address. I put some pressure sensors on the seat, maybe just one, incredibly cheap, hook, hook it up to a Raspberry Pi, we'll come back to that in a second, which I can bury in there because a Raspberry Pi is about this size. That's a full computer, we'll come back to that in a second. It's got a low power community, it's got, it can do Bluetooth, it can do Wi-Fi. 
Um, I can hook it to 3G if I wanted to, but that would be really overkill. I'd have to have an RFID on the human that's sitting it. I think we're all going to have that. Um, we're going to be identified <laughs> in some way, either voluntarily or involuntarily, but most likely voluntarily. We want to participate in this environment, so when I sit in it, the RFID tag is essentially sensed by the sensor, so it now knows that I'm sitting in this chair. It then can, either on request or automatically or continuously, broadcast up to the cloud that uh, John's sitting in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> right, anyways, right. Um, <laughs> there's a whole host of places you could go with this, but um, some low power battery. Uh, and if you go nuts, you can go to Ytricity, <laughs> which is, I still think nuts, but I don't, these days I don't put anything in the nuts category based upon history. Um, but the low power batteries now can run for months, in some cases years, okay? And if they're only pinging at certain times or they're pinging on request, keeping a low, low power um, channel open, uh, you can run these things for ages. They take very little power. Um, and, and finally, the, the chair itself, as I said, has a history and given that there is a semantic web of information, I could, when I query the chair to find out who's in it, it's telling me the CV of the person that's in it. <laughs> Not what the chair is, <laughs> but the person that's in it. So this capability of being able to get extended information from the chair <laughs> is a pretty fascinating idea and it's fully capable of being done, cheaply. From anywhere in the world I can find out who's been sitting in my chair. I can find out what's the history. If I have a piano, who's played on this piano? What songs did they play on this piano? What do those songs sound like? So every component of the physical world, potentially, can be hooked up into this environment, and with the semantic web, we can learn a lot more than we thought. It's really fascinating to me. So the smartphone is your tricorder. <laughs> if you're a Star Trek fan, remember those tricorders? You, you know, they would walk up and say, uh, okay, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, he's not really human. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. But this is what the tricorder looked like. I mean, it was fascinating to think that these guys actually thought of this, you know, 20 plus years ago. But it was also your health information, all right? If you remember, they would just scan it. Well, this is your tricorder. It's got your capabilities that essentially say that eventually, oh, that's Doug. <laughs> okay, right, and what his heart rate is, whatever, whatever Doug cho chooses to share or securely decides to have for himself, but this is what changed all this, all right? This capability of having a communicating computer in your pocket and tied to an unbelievable literal web of information creates this environment. So even the government gets it. <laughs> this is what, essentially, this is SRI, but consulting, this is essentially a, uh, a chart of what the government sees is what's, uh, what the progression is here of smart things. The Internet of Things is what they're actually calling it. But where did it start? It started with RFID, and RFID is kind of in a, kind of a bust in some ways, but it started here, and the question is why, maybe we're, a question is why, is it, why was it somewhat of a bust? Um, but my sense is it's coming back big, okay, that this capability of being able to identify things with tags cheaply is the real core of what's enabling the Internet of Things as we go forward. But as you can see here, a lot of what we're talking about now is already projected into the, the latter part of the decade, uh, and it's already being pulled back. So my sense is, and you see up at the top, software agents and advanced sensor fusion, that's a little bit of what we're talking about of the web essentially using itself to find out information. But what the fundamental change is, is back 10 years ago, this is what we thought it was going to look like. That if, the, when we talked, and Internet of Things is a term that's got a history, 
But this is what we thought it was going to look like. It wasn't an internet of things. It was essentially things that were enabled by IT. And that they would talk to each other. Your shoe would talk to your computer. <laughs> okay, Your shoe could interchange information with your car. But it was a network that wasn't really centralized, if you will. It was machine-to-machine -machine communications. What's changed is these devices and the cloud, where instead of the machine-to-machine -machine communications, it's machine-to-the-cloud communications. Okay? And the reason is that we can. It's much better to do it that way. It's cheaper to do it that way. And we have all the devices to talk from individual chairs, for example, to this, and then hopscotch our way to the Internet. And that's what we're seeing a lot of now. So when we, as soon as we get it to the internet, we have much more value than what we had here 10 years ago. The things that enabled this are extensive network coverage, 3G and 4G, in the wide area network. Ubiquitous, cheap, low power Wi-Fi. Um, we have it here, or are we on LTE? No, I just wondered if, I don't want it now, I just wanted to know, but we, I mean, we have it at Hyannis Golf Club, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is a device to hook up a Raspberry Pi, which I'll come to, um, to Wi-Fi. I think it was $19. That's the size of it. <laughs> that's the whole, that's the Wi-Fi access. All right, I don't know, I find that pretty amazing. Um, yeah, <laughs> because they, I think they, they lose it. I mean, the biggest problem with this stuff is you lose it. I mean, it's, you know, for me, it's like, you know, the change in Google will be, I'll go to Google and say, where are my keys? <laughs> and I mean, I do this, you know, this sounds a bit creepy, but if, if <laughs> I, both my wife and I have each other's log on to, to Apple, to the... Um, um, what is it? Huh? I forgot, I forgot what I'm talking about. Uh, no, not iTunes. Uh, iCloud, yes, thank you. And it's Find My iPhone. So since I have her login, I know where she is. <laughs> she has my login too. <laughs> she knows where I am. Um, but it becomes very handy. If I know that, you know, she's not answering the phone. And I've called her three times. Where is she? <laughs> I can find out. I go to find my iPhone on this or on this, and I find her mm -hmm. iPhone. It gives me a geographic location of where her iPhone is. I can ping it. I can leave a message. I can turn it off. <laughs> I can erase it. <laughs> I can do all those things. But the point is, is it's not just going to be the iPhone. Since everything's addressable the same way that the iPhone is, you go through the cloud, the cloud finds the device, the cloud acts on the device, find my keys, there's my keys, beep them. Okay, that's a very useful thing. That's fully capable of being done now. Um, Bluetooth, 4.0 and Bluetooth Smart. Bluetooth is unbelievable, very low power network. They've lowered the power requirements dramatically. That's how, you know, you play your music in your car, you wind up doing all kinds of different things. Um, it's really evolved. The problem was it was actually somewhat hard to program to each individual device. If you've had Bluetooth, particularly the older generation, sometimes it doesn't sync up with your car, there's something wrong, it doesn't work with Android, something like that. Bluetooth has now been standardized that if the companies follow the standard, it will work with all devices easily. Um, that's Bluetooth Smart. So that handles low power PANs, personal area networks, uh, you know, pretty much around your body type stuff. So you got the networking, you got WANs, LANs, and PANs, all right? And this device has them all, okay? Plus it's got GPS and other radio. Um, ubiquitous cheap processors, sensor platforms. Arduino, uh, the weird part is, this came out of Italy, this came out of the UK. Neither one of these things came out of the US. <laughs> Okay, uh, Arduino was the, if you will, it's 10 years old now. Arduino is a board level computer, all right? Raspberry Pi kind of is the current dominant computer. Um, 
as I said, we'll come back to it, but just in this, uh, this is it. <laughs> I'm going to pass it around, but I'm going to ask you to keep it in the uh, envelope so you, I don't fingerprint out on it. But um, it's a pretty miraculous device, but we'll come back to that. Um, these run OSs that are standard OSs, Linux, okay? <laughs> Raspberry Pi runs Linux, all kinds of variants of Linux. So if you're a Linux programmer, you can essentially hop right on this thing because that's how it, uh, that's how it works. Start programming it. What are you going to program it in? Python. That's the preferred language to be used. Python's the Google you know, language of choice for the most part uh, for mere mortals. And uh, this is what you program in. So you're fully capable. There are thousands and millions, potentially, of people that can program this device. And they are. They're creating all kinds of crazy stuff in the Internet of Things. You have a place to put it. You can go back to the cloud. Cloud is incredibly cheap. How will I put it? Probably with REST interfaces, web services interfaces. I'm going to essentially exchange information bidirectionally between that device and the cloud, and then the cloud takes it from there, and God knows what happens to it after that. So these REST protocols, which I presume some of you are familiar with, are really, really a powerful component of this. And again, it creates the environment of assembling systems. The ability to go out to different web services and bring back the information, digest it, and then create something and send it back. And then we have something to see it on, or hear it on, or feel it on. And the last thing was what the call was a lot better batteries. Okay, batteries haven't evolved quite as rapidly as everything else, but they're, get, they're a lot better than they were. So here is a platform for the IoT. This is the Raspberry Pi that's running around here. This is what it has. When I was at IBM, the gigahertz processor was like nirvana. We're going to have a gigahertz processor. Oh my God, what would people do? <laughs> it's a gigahertz processor right? on this board. It, it's flexible. It starts out at 700. You can upscale to a gigahertz. 512 megabytes of memory. SD card storage, theoretically unlimited local storage. Two USB jacks, networking jack built in, 10, 100 Ethernet, Wi-Fi add-on available, that's it. That little thing goes in one of the USBs. Now it's Wi-Fi enabled. OS, Linux, common OS, not some weird machine OS. Debian is the variant, is the preferred one. Can run Android, so all those Android things, theoretically, you could program for Android. Programming is Python, or PyPy, which is an optimized version of Python, and it weighs 1.6 ounces, and that's the size of it. It will not fit in an Altoids box, because the, the corners are square. <laughs> Otherwise, it would. I think you'll see that they're going to round the corners. <laughs> well, it's, it is. It's kind of one of the things that people want. They want it in an Altoids box, because you have to buy a case. <laughs> 43 bucks. <laughs> 43 dollars. Wait, you could, probably, yeah. You can see even here, uh, down 34, you know, 35. I just buy from Amazon because I don't have to pay shipping. Same story. <laughs> um, it's the number one bestseller in computer CPU processors. <laughs> but it's, I, it astounds me. Look at what I have on this list, and it's 43 dollars or 29 on eBay. <laughs> Sometimes it's harder to hook these things up to Wi-Fi devices, et cetera. They're, a lot of the Linux variants, I think this is interesting, but not, you know, it's, it, you don't have to do it this way, but it's a lot easier. If you want to example, make a bathroom scale, and I have one, as we'll come to in a sec again, um, <laughs> just wondering. Uh, if you want to make a bathroom scale, all right, you, you want that scale to connect to Wi-Fi, right? So that it's essentially going to, in your house, essentially post up, send your way to the internet, have a nice day. Um, in order to do that, you've got to do a Wi-Fi connection. You've got to have programmability to do Wi-Fi. This just makes it really easy, <laughs> the imp. Okay, we're seeing a lot of these component, components that now allow for this connectivity to be really easily done, drag and drop interface, so if you want to build something, and I'm specifically talking about you, <laughs> the cape, 
okay, with all the, you know, uh, uh, ocean capabilities around us, the ability to build sophisticated devices that are able to communicate in this way is really easy to do now. That's the good news and the bad news. Uh, it's easy to compete against things that perhaps were of an older generation. And we're starting to see that. I'll show you an example. But again, there's, there, these guys are picking up momentum. This is, this is a startup, all right? It originally was funded where? Kickstarter. Okay, we'll come back to that. But now it's dealing with GE. Because <laughs> GE is a little behind the curve. IBM's got, a, got an offering here called Moat Runner. IBM's doing some good work in this space. But these guys are running rings around them. They've still got the entrepreneurial spirit, IBM, you know, it's research, blah, blah, blah. So there is opportunity to come in from the bottom here with both device capability and software capability that isn't like competing with Facebook or competing with Google or competing with Amazon. So this is opportunity land. I'm a little negative on the other opportunities in pure software, but this space is still pretty much open. The other thing that's interesting, at least to me, is there are tons of really sophisticated computers sitting out used, all right? Uh, example, the first generation iPads, all right? Here you got this beautiful display, not as beautiful as the current one, but who cares in some applications, not as powerful a processor, but it's got four radios in it. All right, it's got you know, all the network, it's got a host of programmers that know how to program to it. Why don't you make devices that from a price point, point of view use the use technology? Example of that, if you go to the CIC in Cambridge, the Cambridge Innovation Center. Cambridge Innovation Center is a big incubator. I mean, lots and lots of people and they have shared conference rooms. So they have, you have to book your conference room. Well, how do you book it? Well, you book it over the web. But each conference room has an old iPad at the door announcing what conference room it is and who's got it. <laughs> because there are fights, of course. The guy's meeting runs over, hey, I got the conference. Well, this clarifies all that. <laughs> it's right on the screen. In fact, since the iPad has a speaker in it, it winds up telling you, you have five minutes left to get out of this room. <laughs> and then it starts an alarm, <laughs> which essentially says, get back out of this room. <laughs> and so here is an application that probably you wouldn't go and buy new iPads for, nor would you perhaps buy a whole bunch of Raspberry Pis and build the system. They just built it using old iPads. So this technology, I mean, when you think about the, the capabilities that exist in an iPhone or an iPad, even in the old ones, it's enormous. And it's really cheap. Not as cheap as I would have hoped, to be honest. But when you think about the number of things you might have to add on to the pie, like a display, <laughs> all right, you're going to start getting up to these numbers. But then you look at the number and say, it's 250 bucks. Give me a break. So the used market, I think, is a great opportunity area as well to build very sophisticated systems using these as the, as the hub of those systems. I encourage you to look at this product. Uh, I think it's a fascinating product. It's called IFT. It's like gift without the G. But it stands for if then, then that. And it allows, what they've done is they've created these channels. And these are examples of the channels. Um, Dropbox is a channel, ESPN. So uh, email, uh, a feed. So uh, example, very, very simply. You can say, gee, if there's a post to Facebook that has my, one of my grandkids' names in it, <laughs> send me a text. Put it in Dropbox. <laughs> um, if there's something that goes into this folder in Dropbox, send me an email with the contents of what that was as an attachment. It is stunningly easy and it works. But it becomes the glue for you to do things that you would think you would need programmers to do, and expensive programmers. So this creates that environment of the web talking and using itself 
because you can chain these together as well. So for example, I, Paul Krugman, if Paul Krugman puts a blog post up for reasons unknown, I have it sent to me email. The email then goes to a filter program that I've actually written that essentially drops it into another app for me that now I can full text search all this stuff very easily. But the point is, again, it's assembly. It's not programming. I know this exists. It exists with other things like Facebook. So you start saying, if I could hook Facebook to Twitter and Twitter to email and email to Dropbox and Dropbox to something else like Wemo Motion, Anybody know Wemo? Wemo is a Belkin product that essentially is the Wi-Fi version of X10, if you go back to X10 for home automation. So if you want to dim the lights, turn the lights, sense the lights, open your garage door, whatever, if Paul Krugman posts the blog post, I can open my garage door. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you can do. So now you've got the internet of things in your hands, okay? You can start essentially assembling this stuff very cheaply using very high level products like this as at least a component of your application. It's really cool stuff. It's Fitbit, it's on my wrist. <laughs> See, <laughs> right there. I should have set the alarm, <laughs> which was when, when to stop. Um, because it has an alarm, it has a vibrator in it. So what is a Fitbit? A Fitbit is a clear example of Internet of Things storing. Great technology, great design, I think. Almost five years old. They started the No Wait, okay, and I had the original. Brad Feld, my friend, is an investor in this company, so I wound up getting the early release. And it was a clip that clipped onto your belt and essentially was an electronic pedometer that when you got near your machine, your computer, all right, it would do a sync using at that point, I think a proprietary radio protocol, okay? And it would sync to the app on your computer and the app on your computer would then sync to the web and you would be able to get how many steps did you take this day? How are you doing every day? How many calories did you burn? How many calories should you have burned? Are you over or under? And it worked until it fell off <laughs> and got run over by the lawnmower. <laughs> and you call them up and say, gee, I need another one. And they send you one more. And then you're on your own. I lost four of them. Um, and gave up. They essentially said, I can't deal with this anymore. Until they came out with this, which the flex is this band right here. Okay, now what does this do? It essentially is a high-powered high pedometer. Uh, but if you're after the 10,000 steps a day, that's one way of getting it. It also measures your sleep. How well do you sleep? Because you sleep with it, you can take a shower with it, you can go swimming with it. Okay, the device itself, this is the band. Um, this is the device. <laughs> okay, now what's it doing? It's communicating with the phone or over Wi-Fi. So if I go and I look at this, and well, you can see it here. So you go from here, you get this. As soon as I power up the app on the iPhone, it syncs with the device. And this is what I talk about losing things. I mean, <laughs> how easy is this to lose? But it tells me what my step count is, how many miles have I gone, et cetera. It's very instant feedback on what you're doing. But think of it, this is Internet of Things, right? If I wanted to share this information, I can. It's on the web, it's part of the app that they essentially provide as a web app or on the iPhone or on the Android, which are all ways of looking into where's the Android getting it, where's it getting the information? Off the web. It's going from the device to the iPhone, up to the web and back down again, not just exchanging between the app and the device itself. Um, it has an API, it's open. So if you wanted to incorporate this data into another app that you've built, use the API, it's a REST interface, same what we talk, talked about earlier. Now you've extended the capabilities of whatever you're doing to incorporate a new device into the application that you're building. Um, lighting. <laughs> IFT, 
we just talked about, I can control the lights too. How do I control the lights? Well, I could have the Hue system from Philips. Hue essentially is LED lighting on steroids. You're able to control the colors, okay, as well as the brightness. So depending on, gee, the stock market's down, you might want to turn your room red. <laughs> <laughs> stock market's up, room's green. You can turn on the lights when the sun rises, you can turn them off when the sun sets. Think of that. I have a very expensive Lutron system that apparently was built prior to the time that the sunsets and sunrises were known. <laughs> um, these lights communicate with each other. This isn't cheap. It's about 200 bucks for three lights right now. This is the controller, but it is an awesome concept. <laughs> And again, if Paul Krugman makes a blog post, I can turn the room red. I mean, it's, you've got this enormous capability now, again, Internet of Things, all right? Now I'm dealing with lighting, all right? Since it's all LED-based, um, it's low power. There is a mesh network, similar to the way that I just ta told you isn't the way that these things are built, but this thing has to communicate with the controller and I'm not sure what protocol, I believe they're using Bluetooth to do that, but then they have their own mesh network where the lights can talk to each other, so if they're out of range of the controller, they can still be part of the environment. Um, this is interesting from a startup perspective. This is Philips. <laughs> there are startups in this space, but I wouldn't want to be competing with the distribution of Philips. So somewhere inside the connections there, there's opportunity, but when you're dealing with end products like this, the atoms part of this is probably gonna be controlled by the big companies. These are other, and I'll just go through these quickly. We're almost ready here, kids. Jerry the Bear. Uh, Jerry the Bear is a diabetic bear. Uh, uh, created, uh, this was a company that was founded at, by Beta Spring. Uh, now is up in Boston. Two design guys, or a guy and a gal, built it is essentially for kids that have diabetes to understand how diabetes works. You have to feed the bear, you have to give the bear insulin, there's color sensors in the bear's mouth, so you feed him different things that essentially change his insulin level, which he talks about how he's feeling bad, how he's feeling good. Um, and it gets the kid associated with what taking care of the bear essentially is reflecting back on taking care of himself or herself. So again, this is an extension of Internet of Things. It essentially tracks what, the, what, the di what diabetes is like. The Pi microwave, this is down here. This is a Pi, a Raspberry Pi that we got running around. It's essentially got here a scanner a barcode scanner, and it's, a, it's attached to the microwave. What it also has is voice reco, so you can talk to your microwave and say, you know, put it on high for, turn the mic, and you do it Star Trek like microwave. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yeah, that's right. You can tell it what your, it's got access to the web, so you, there's a database of how long it takes to cook certain microwave type dishes. So you tell it it's a Stouffer's macaroni and cheese, and it's off to the races. It turns on the appropriate amount of power. If you want it to, essentially, you're cooking an egg in the microwave, or you gotta stir it halfway through, it talks to you and says, okay, it's time to stir. Stir, close the door, it powers back up again, I'm done. Um, it has a scanner because it can recognize the product that you're, you have based upon if the st you don't want to tell it, says Stouffer's macaroni and cheese, you s just put the box underneath and it sets it up, says put it in and off you go. This is a smart microwave, but it's connected to the internet. All right, that's where it's getting its recipe data. That's where it knows what the appropriate things are. So think about this. this why would you want a dumb microwave? <laughs> uh, if you know anything about the history of the internet, the first camera phone on the internet was essentially at a university and it was, it was focused on a coffee pot because the people who were at the university in the research department had to walk a long way to, in parts of it to get to the coffee pot so they wanted to see whether or not the coffee pot had any coffee in it. 
rather than walk. So bottom line is that's what they did. They put a f camera, their first webcam, if you will, that was focused on the coffee pot. It's happening again. This is essentially the ability to make coffee from your iPhone. Okay, the, you can see how much, whether there's any coffee in the pot, whether and whether or not the thing should put another in as little robotics. I'm not going to get into robotics. Whether it should put another thing in the in the coffee maker to make some more coffee. All right. Again, why would you want a dumb coffee machine? Why can't I just find out if the coffee's ready or it will wake me up and make my coffee? This thing here I find fascinating. I am a backer of this. This is Xiphius. I'll just uh, take one second. I'm going to throw a video up here and hopefully you'll get a sense of this. You can see it, it is a Kickstarter project. Hold on. This is the Azores. <laughs> There's Xiphius. And off he goes. <laughs> now, what Xiphius has in it is a camera. Okay, it's also a full computer. It goes like crazy. It's got two really, I mean, it's just a fun device. It's controlled by the iPhone or the iPad. iPod. No, I'm sorry, uh, iPad. <laughs> but this, the worst thing you can do if you're a guy like me is go to Kickstarter. I just want to do them all. I mean, I keep, you know, but look, here's the camera. Totally waterproof. So if you're out surfing or something, or you want to photograph the kids, which, you know, we do, you take Xiphius out there. First of all, it just flies through the water like crazy. I mean, it's just a fun device. And that's what I think more and more we're going to see that people use their creativity not to make a better, you know, shelf on the, at Walmart, but instead make something completely off the wall. Just as an example, the last Kickstarter project that I funded. So what happens with Kickstarter? I don't know if you're familiar with Kickstarter, but Kickstarter is the way that these things get financed. They're not financed by VCs. They're not even financed by angels, because angels like software. <laughs> okay, But this is where it's at. And it's somehow, again, the finance community is thick as hell on some of this stuff. But the point is, they have, there's a different alternative finance path here, and it's Kickstarter. So what happens with Kickstarter? Do I get equity in this company? No, I get the product. <laughs> I'm essentially, when they build the product, and I'm, that's a big if, um, I get one. And they offer me, gee, I could get a t-shirt, or I can get the product and a t-shirt, or I can get the deluxe product with a deluxe t-shirt, and each one of those changes. So I think this was 245 for me. Um, and I'll get one of these allegedly in March if they make the goal. If they don't get to their goal, then essentially the money comes back. Okay, so you wind up that it's, you're, yeah, you're making a bet on something, but the presumption is they're gonna, if they make the goal, they're gonna be able to build it. The other thing that I find fascinating about this example itself is where's the company? It's in the Azores. <laughs> That's where you were. It's not in the United States, it's, it's in the Azores. They're raising money to build this a spectacular device using Raspberry Pi, iPads and iPhones as the, and Androids as the control device, uh, as, and be able to do all this sort of stuff. So this is a global phenomena, all right? It's happening everywhere. And the interesting thing for me is it's the best minds that are creating this unbelievably cool stuff, I think. So just, I'll just go back and then we're going to wrap this. Um, so this is Xiphius. I, I was saying that I, I invested in this one, invested, I bought it, uh, but you think you're investing. It's a very weird gig. The, last, the other one that I bought, which was a little more pricey, allows me to have my bicycle wheels turn into a picture of whatever I want as the wheels are moving. 
So there's LEDs that are in the, in the wheels. And so I can put a picture of me, my grandkids, a commercial. I could even run a video on my bike wheels, <laughs> both back and front. You follow me here? As they're spinning, they've figured out how to essentially create the LEDs to make, to make a display inside the bike wheel. Now, what's the usefulness of that? Absolutely none. <laughs> Maybe advertising. But I couldn't resist. I gotta have this. <laughs> I gotta have it. Square, okay, another Internet of Things thing. That's the credit card reader, and this is just a plug-in, plugs into your iPhone, plugs into your iPad. It's been around now a couple years, but is clearly an Internet of Things device. Where can you buy Square that you would never have thought you could buy Square before? Starbucks. Starbucks is going, well, in many cases, they're free because you sign up for the service not just the device. But again, this is an example of Internet of Things. That's a thing that essentially now connects to the Internet to do credit card processing in a way that you never could before. Google Glass, <laughs> a lot of controversy. Not a big fan for me. I mean, I'm geeky, but I'm not, I find it extraordinarily creepy still. Maybe I'll get over it, but if you know what it is, I mean, this is essentially Google Glass, is your glasses uh, have a camera and a screen. The screen is essentially the equivalent of, I forgot, 15 inch display that you're seeing when you look over to the side, it's a very small screen, but it looks to your brain like it's a very big, big screen. So you are continually connected to the web. You tap it, shake your head as gestures to make things change. But the, the thing that creeps out most people is the camera. It continually has a, you can obviously turn it off and there's a little red light that says you're being recorded, but people can turn off the red light and you're being recorded. I don't, as we just indicated, <laughs> you don't wanna be recorded all the time. <laughs> and, and so when you see somebody wearing Google Glass, and, and I mean, Rich Miner, a, a good friend at, at, uh, at Google, the co-inventor of Android, co-founder of Android, um, he wears Google Glass all the time. And it's like when you're talking to him, you almost have this tendency to <laughs> you know, want to get out of his line of sight. It's because, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? I, so this is a real phenomena. I mean, it's an unbelievable piece of technology. It's not out for general public use yet, but it should be later this year. Uh, they're waterproof, as you can see. <laughs> um, so I don't know how this is going to evolve, but it's clearly an Internet of Things play. All right, it's your glasses. Can the camera be turned on or closed? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have one. I, there's a lot, even in the, the tech cognoscenti, there's a lot of discussion about this as, as not being good. <laughs> um, this is Wemo, how you can turn on your lamps and all this from anywhere in the world. It's all internet based. Uh, cheap, okay, you can buy it at Staples. And the Nest thermostat, another example of being able to set, set temperatures, all the stuff that is that crazy stuff. If it, the two biggest things in my house that drive me crazy, the alarm system, absolutely the most brain dead systems in the world are alarm systems. That's all gonna go away with this. And the thermostat, okay? If, I mean, try to program a thermostat. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, now it's all done on, on your iPhone. Essentially, it's going to do it. So these are all apps using these platforms or existing platforms, certainly using the internet and all the capabilities of it. Oops, I'm sorry, somehow it went backwards. Um, I think it's a, it's a wrap anyway. The last thing is about Kickstarter. Well, let me just finish. I lost it here, anyway, here we are. Um, so, <laughs> this is the summary. I hope I have explained why I think it's not just the web and only better, okay? It's different. It changes, I think, everything. 
because we're dealing with everything and we're part of those things. There's only one machine. All screens are windows into it and controllers of it. Optional. It'll grow its own intelligence by being able to understand itself. Privacy is a goner. <laughs> Societal dependence on the one machine, and Kevin uh, uh, Kelly, uh, the editor of Wired, ex-editor of Wired, founder of Wired magazine, refers to this as the one. <laughs> the machine is the one, the Borg. Our dependence on it will become extraordinary, and therefore the risks to it are great. Protecting it is going to be a very big industry because as we become more dependent, it's got to not just work, but it's got to be secure. And finally, we're all part of it. We're part of the one. <laughs> Um, that's another discussion. <laughs> um, I lost my end slide here, too. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to end on that, and then we'll take questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> thank you.